Hey there friends and welcome back to Strange Rebel Gaming. I'm Brianna White and today we're going to be watching a panel that first aired at the first SRG Con in 2020. Now this panel was created because it was such a highly requested topic by the SRG community, by the Strange Rebel Gaming community. It is mental health and video games. Now I know there are usually a lot of feelings when mental health and video games are put together, but um, this panel left me feeling so hopeful and so inspired about how video games can bring us together instead of the opposite. And so I hope it does the same for you. Our expert guest on this panel is Dr. Ryan Kelly, who is one of the authors of The Psychology of Final Fantasy, Surpassing the Limit Break, which is a fantastic read. You have to buy it. You have to read it. It is absolutely amazing. And again, totally and completely inspiring. So we cover a lot of ground in this panel and I hope that you enjoy it. Again, this originally aired for the very first SRG Con in 2020, but as a reminder, we have another SRG Con coming up on April 22nd and all of the information is in the description below. If you would like to join us for that, we'd love to have you. And now let's get on to the video, enjoy. Hello, SRG Con. Welcome back from your break. Did you stretch? Did you hydrate? Did you chat at the lunch tables? Did you make a new friend? How is your SRG Con going? You can let me know in the chat. I do have it open here in the other tab. Today and right now, we have a very amazing panel that so many people requested when we sent out a request form a month ago or so. This panel is mental health, and video games. We have an incredibly broad ranging topic here, but we're gonna try and narrow it down. We have an outline we're gonna do our best to stick to and answer as many questions that you all have as possible. With me, joining me is the amazing guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Dr. Ryan Kelly. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yay. And where can they find you? What are you all about? Tell us everything. Sure. Um, so you could probably most readily find me um, at on Twitter at D-R-R Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Um, and I'm pretty responsive. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be better with it. Um, but uh, I'm a psychologist, and um, I specialize in a number of areas. But one of them is gaming psychology. Well, gaming and geek psychology. So it's... Um, essentially looking at how to use game, gaming and gingdom to improve the well-being of others, and to some extent um, to help intervene on mental health conditions like depression or anxiety or ADHD or Asperger's. Um, that being said, a lot of my work uh, is speaking at comic and gaming conventions. I'm also an illustrator, so um, at one point I had co-authored and co-illustrated the first Aspie comic superhero, um, and was kind of those endeavors. Um, and then eventually, as we got older, or as I got older, I speak like I'm seven years old. When I became an adult, I started a media company with a colleague of mine, Geeks Like Us. And Geeks Like Us um, is basically saying, trying to merge psychology, gaming, and geekdom, giving it to a community, creating a community of streamers and gamers and geeks to talk about their passions and find ways to thrive in them instead of feel embarrassed or put down or different because of them. I am obsessed with that entire mission statement. Uh, <laughs> video games haven't been around for a lot of time compared to everything else that humans get to enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as a media form, it's still pretty new. And usually um, money comes first and technology comes first and it just goes barreling ahead and mental health and psychology, that trails behind a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so mm -hmm. the first thing that you started hearing when video games became a thing is video game addiction. And that was like the very sure. first thing that you heard about. But you never got to hear about all of the benefits that video games can have on your it's, mental health. Oh, my gosh. It, it, there's actually a, an article that we tend to send around as gaming psychologists. It's from like the 1940s, I believe. But it was like the dangers of the radio. And it's, you know, it's like, your, are your kids just hovered around the radio all day? You know, and it's sort of well, we hovered around worries. the radio. <laughs> yeah, Come just sort on. of like, you know, I know. But I think the idea is we worry very much about our youth. And in some ways, that's a good function, but it gets a little, we, we get a little catastrophizing sometimes where if something looks different, we start to worry, you know, and, and historically, evolutionarily, that's a good thing to worry. But we could say we're beyond that. And it's like, well, but let's look to the research and let's look at, let's weigh pros and cons. 
And it's not this horrible thing. I love thing. that. Of course not. I love looking to the research and weighing the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power. And <laughs> it is being updated all the time. But I, yes. I haven't seen a ton of studies on the benefits of mental health and video games. You see a lot of anecdotal right. stuff. You see a lot of blog posts <clears throat> and articles. And if you just talk to people in the community, the benefits are very clear. But academically, I don't feel like there's a lot. Have you seen some stuff? You know, it's it's interesting. We actually have like a ton. But to your point, you know, the point of research is to disseminate it. Right. Mm. And we, we sort of we'd like to say that, you know, news media outlets and stuff would be a great way to disseminate it. But the the problem that exists is things that tend to be disseminated are things that are going to get a lot of clicks and things that get a lot of clicks are things that are pretty scary or sensational or very heavily emotionally loaded. So what's going to you know spread more? Um, kids who play even aggressive video games have been shown to manage stress better, like someone punching a punching bag or uh, danger. Could, could this video game make your child a killer? You know, like, I mean, it's, you know, yes. So, so you hear a lot of these ones, um, that can be scary. Right. And then yeah. usually they're taken out of context. Usually, a big, usually it's a big example is there is no research to say that video games is correlated with violence. None. There's a handful of studies where it's like, okay, so some kids who play really, really aggressive video games temporarily for like 45 minutes afterwards are more likely to use aggressive language and this and that, but that's not violence and it's not, it's long not. lasting either. But, but again, people who take those studies aren't, they're, they're pulling stuff out of it, conclusions. They don't know aggression is different for violence. And then you just see video games cause violence, right? Well, so there's also the yeah. correlation versus causation sort of situation that you have here. A lot of Asians in that sentence. Yes. <laughs> uh, you have, you know, violent yep. video games causing maybe aggressive behavior for a little short time after, but mm -hmm. Is that because of the adrenaline coursing through your body because of competition? And are those sorts of things triggered by any stressful event in your life? Yes. It's well, it's actually a really good point. I mean, I think, um, you know, the games that tend to be the most problematic, I guess, from like, you know, kids have maybe sometimes GTA. Struggling. GTA is one of them or, you know, honestly, mainly it's like um, competitive shooters. Right. But it's the same thing. Like, if, a, if you got a bunch of kids playing pickup basketball, yeah, they're getting their yeah. fights on the court and they might develop some anger problems because they're like not learning how to deal with their co competitive frustrations. But that's not like don't play basketball. That's like teach the kid how to manage the frustration on the court. I think the difference is sometimes parents don't really get involved because they not that they're bad. They just don't know how. And there's not like referees necessarily, um, you know, to manage a game. And so right. it's a little bit, you know, moderation. Can you imagine super... if there were <laughs> referees well, in Call of Duty matches? Oh my gosh, but it's so funny with these with these new gaming companies like Riot and so on, where they have like confederates to sort of in there as players, but they're actually like, you know, <gasps> wa watch it. And like, and that's cool. Like a, a little that's bit so of cool. accountability is cool, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I love that. And uh, mm. because we've kind of talked about, you know, where this topic has come from and, and why this topic is mm. important, I want to kind of ask you about your early experiences in video games, because I've oh, talked sure. on my channel a lot about how my whole family were gamers. My mother cool. was a gamer. I mean, she from the very first video game, she was really, really interested in the technology. And uh, she played, you know, the very first Zelda games or the very first Mario games, like really early on. And she passed that on to me. I would sit on her lap wow. and play King's Quest on the PC oh, wow. when I was three years old. So King's I have Quest, a lot yeah. of it's I, I'm back. very lucky. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Back. Yeah. yeah, I'm very lucky that it's a family experience for me. Um, so oh, I have a lot of positive associations with video games. Uh, what yes. are some of your earlier memories? So my mom was amazing. Um, she she wasn't really a gamer, but um, yeah, I, I sort of say sometimes to parents who are not gamers, I say, listen, think about the 1960s when the cliche of a good parent with a, a child was to throw the baseball with their, with their child. That was the cliche. Mm -hmm. And it's not because there's something remarkable about baseball. It's not like that's the way to, it's just because that was what was interesting for children at the time. 
over 70% of kids liked baseball. So you throw the baseball with your kid because it's what they're interested in. Um, right now, 93% of people 13 to 18 play video games. Over 60% of all ages play video games in industrialized countries. So the idea is video games are the new baseball. And my mom was really, really good. Like whatever we're interested in, whether baseball, tennis, soccer, basketball, a lot of sports for me, but also video games. Um, she'd do it with us. So we would play. I mean, she was awful. <laughs> she was, who, I don't care. We just love having our mom playing with us, right? Yeah. So we, my brother's I and my mother. And so, so she made it this really supportive thing where we didn't feel guilty playing Mario. She's not, I mean, we're limited time. You got an hour a day and that's fine. She wanted us out and that's fine. Did but she really set that structure that early on? She was ahead of her time. She, she knew. That wow, like, that is. Yeah, she knew that like my kids need to check their domains of life. They need to be getting face to face this amount, school this amount. She was she was she is and was an amazing mother. But it allowed us to have this very structured, proactive type of gaming where it was responsible. We could enjoy ourselves and we enjoyed it with my mom. But so we started with the NES. Um, that's what we started with. So the original Zelda loved it. Right huge original Zelda fan. Um, didn't actually play the Final Fantasy until I was older, actually. Um, so I didn't really play That's a lot of That's probably pretty NES. fair. <laughs> That's fair, right? Um, yeah. And then I, we, we pretty much followed. We'd save our money and, and buy at least one of the newer consoles, every console. And me and my, my uh, two brothers were huge gamers um, growing up. Um, but it's funny because I, I was also really big into sports, and that's actually – I think where most of my peer success up, th up through college uh, came from. But so when I was little, I played, there was a lull during formative uh, competitive sport years of high school. And then I picked it up again as an adult, which, you know. So funny. That yeah. is exactly my story too. Really? Played oh, it a cool. lot as a kid. Yeah. Didn't play much at all in high school and college and then picked it up again after college. Oh yeah. I mean, I, and it's so awesome. You know, it's it's such a what a wonderful thing that our jobs allow that right for us to very oh, easily yes. as adults go back in without any weird feelings about it <laughs> and a knowledge that it's awesome. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's really interesting. This idea as I'm looking back on it back in the day when you were a kid and you had your Nintendo system, mm -hmm. you weren't a gamer. You played games. But everybody played games. It was not an identity. It didn't become sure. one until, you know, for me, it was around mm -hmm. high school, college age. And at that mm -hmm. point, it also had this connotation of counterculture. You were also right. a nerd. You were a geek. And that wasn't right. cool until I got out of college. I don't know That's when that right. changed, but I'm stoked about it. Yeah. In, in my experience, um, I think it started, so I didn't get into gaming research until 2006. I was, I was, I got into college and I was just really excited about, I, I knew I liked psychology and I, I really was excited about this, that gaming is the future of interaction, human interaction, virtual human interaction is the future. And so I was very excited about getting into it. And I did a small study with Blizzard where I was like, can I have access to a few things to study some social skills with Aspies who might play and this and they're like yeah, yeah, yeah and i was like oh my god this is that's amazing that's so simple. nice oh my the, I mean, wow like, is gaming come well here's what's great people who this is just this is more anecdotal there's some stats out there but i'm more saying anecdotally people who play video games tend to just be more open to mental health needs um and many tend to also have uh, mental health needs there's nothing wrong with that at all in fact really i would say they're just more aware of their mental yeah. health needs. There are a lot of people who have mental health needs, but they're just like trying to just bite the bullet through the day and act like it's not there. Um, but I think there is a level of open-mindedness that come in with your, your typical typical gamer. And so when, whenever we work with um, anybody in the field um, and, and we work with a lot, whether the gaming industry or developers or uh, people like yourself, influencers like yourself and so on, it's like many of them have this passion for, oh no, absolutely, mental health. What can we do? What can we do to help our players? Right? Like, and, and you're just like, this is, you guys are great. Thank you. It's, it's like, wow. Yeah. You know, I, I wish, I wish. A whole group of people that cares about this. Right. You're kind of like, man, you guys are really getting a bad rap as far as being like, you know, you're making games to like get our kids addicted. But then you, you know, you meet them and they're like inviting a psychologist to help. Like, how can we be more ethical? 
Like how should we do our reinforcement rates with our system? Is this loot box too equivalent to gambling? Should we do this? And we're like, yeah, maybe the key system is not the best. You probably should make this, you know, and they're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And they're like, what can we do for you? Mm. Like, it's great. I mean, you know, so I love it. I just love, I love that. All psychology. Well, and I think especially as you talk about Blizzard, I can imagine they had a huge desire to reframe or rework some of the things that they were doing because they had this connotation of the basement wow player who right. was entirely addicted. And all of the articles at the time were, <laughs> my marriage broke up because of wow. Is, right. is well, that I mean, really right. why? Well, it, I, I, the, I think the short answer is no. Um, it's something Thank like, you. It, reminds, it's, it reminds me of a, an article that came out probably maybe 17 months ago, where it's 200 divorces in, Engl in the UK. The primary re reason for it was Fortnite, right? Um, the idea is the, 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 one of the significant others was struggling with their priorities, right? Like that's the thing. The, the, a lot of times the problem of games is not the games necessarily, is that maybe sometimes we don't use moderation, like many things in life, and it starts to take away from other stuff. Yeah, if I'm not having quality date nights with my significant other because I'm playing Fortnite all the time, sure, I can see why the, why the significant other would be like, I blame Fortnite. But it's really, man, that other person was not being a very good spouse or you know yeah. whatever it might be. And so it, it yeah. kind of gets a, a bad rap, you know? It did. It did for a long time. I feel like we've done a lot of really great work to negate that over time. Yeah. But man, right. when WoW and Diablo it's... were new, Blizzard oh, yeah. had us locked in. Blizzard, Ugh. I feel like, has some of the best hold on an extremely intense reward system. There's something about a Blizzard game when you play it, yeah. oh, you're playing a lot of it. You're going to lose yourself a little <laughs> bit. I remember in 2007, the average amount of gameplay for the average WoW player, there's 9 million players at the time, so more than the population of Denmark, I know was the big stat that everyone liked to say. It was impressive. And that, that was before the age of 250 million Fortnite players, you know, two and a half years. Before. Right. But, you know, so that was like a whole, that was a game changer. But, uh, but I remember it was a big deal. And I remember the average player spent five hours a day, which that is too much, probably, right? If you're a 13 to 18 year old, that's definitely interfering with, like other five hours <laughs> is too much just checking <laughs> if if so sort of the idea was you know like if you're if you're a 13 to 18 year old and you're coming home from school and you've got a limited amount of time and you know five hours of it is to gaming yeah you're probably not getting your homework done or having family dinner and etc exercise or something um again it's not the game's fault but it, i think it was just this exciting it's like this whole world right you're like and and so again it's it's i'm not of course i'm not saying you know, gaming shouldn't be done responsibly like everything. Yeah, like moderate, like everything else. Um, but I think at that time, the focus was less on how do we make gaming healthier and more on gaming is unhealthy, how do we take it away? And, and it's like, no, that's not the Correct. right. Correct. That's not the right way to, that's silly, you know, like, but. And, and I wonder, I, I've been doing a lot of um, research myself mm -hmm. lately about, mm -hmm. um, proper dopamine levels, you know, mm -hmm. and looking back to my own childhood, I spent way more than five hours a day playing video games. And that's because my sure. whole family did it. It was a family yeah. activity. We played Ocarina of Time together, but we mm -hmm. also played Diablo 2 together. Oh, and we all had our solid. desktops set up in yep. a row, yep. all four of us, and we'd hop into a game together and play for all night, all night. And I look back on that and think, I don't know if I realized it was a problem at the time, but I look back and realize it was a problem for us now. Right. Um, and I, I wonder if maybe we just hadn't been properly inoculated against the dopamine response of the of the reward systems in video games yet, because it's quite it's much more intense and interactive than yeah. TV. Would you agree? Oh, for sure. You know, it's it's and I love that you had that. I mean, if you look back here, my kids and I play on those right so and then i have this set up here and so we'll play roblox all i have two children and we line up and it can be great and you know, of course you have your time that's so fun but you know it is about you know you have two types i'm going to use the word addiction very loosely here okay okay because that everyone tends to grab that word uh, with this stuff you know that um 
but you know, when it comes to struggling with an addiction or just struggling to stop yourself from doing something that you're like, I, I really should not do this as much. Um, it can either be something where you develop a physical dependency, like a drug, um, uh, or it can be something called like a processing addiction, like gambling, shopping, as um, uh, mm. family friendly, but other, you know, other other things. Um, and thank I, you, I, by I, the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so you know, it's gaming isn't what what I say sometimes is gaming is simply a tool. It's an interactive yes. medium for education, entertainment, socialization. Um, psychological growth and development, that's all it is. So it's an incredibly powerful tool and it can be used mm -hmm. in incredible, incredible ways, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's when, you, when you've got a, a young developing mind that maybe isn't quite evolved enough in the prefrontal cortex to be able to manage the bombardment of stimulus or the rate of reinforcement yeah. that comes with the game or the excitement, it's like the, the game's not necessarily a problem, but the kid might struggle to be like, all right, I should probably, you know, I should probably not do that. Um, right. So to your point, you know, dopamine levels, which is, a, you know, our, our primary reward system in our brain, um, they differ. If I read a book, well, I'm probably getting a little bit, a little bit of dopamine, right? But if I'm, you know, playing like Street Fighter 2 at a tournament in an arcade with a bunch of people shouting like, yeah, you know, like whatever. Yeah, it's going to be going way up, right? And I'm going to want that again. But then you sort of have to ask the question, what's the problem? The game or me not knowing how to manage that desire that to want more? And that's a big debate right now. The World Health Organization has already decided that they, the ICD-11, which is our diagnostic book, is going to have gaming disorder in there and online addiction. I saw that. I, that was sure. a big news article when it came out. Yeah. I mean, so that'll be in there. Um you know, and a lot of us are kind of scattered on that. They, they're they not without research to say that we need more um, mental health focus on how to help families and people who struggle with problematic gaming. But to say addiction, it's like, let's just not use that word for a while because it's, it's, it's just everyone gets caught up. We're on not ready word. for it. Yeah, it's just not yeah. helpful. But the idea is, um, to your point, having a processing problem like that, where your reward center kind of restructures and it starts to become problematic. Well, of course, we want to find ways to help you. And just because it's video game doesn't mean we'll be like, well, you know, it's not the video game. You just need to figure it out. Of course, we'll be like, all right, let's, you know, all right, let's, let's. So what do we need to do? Right. Um, right. But yeah, it, it is, it is a fascinating thing. The dopamine yeah. wiring of it. So, so then the next, I think, inevitable question is mm -hmm. how do we set those healthy boundaries? How mm -hmm. do we do that? It's, it's a really good question. Um, the favorite way I like to say is you get all, you know, if you're a gamer and you play games, um, or even if you're not a gamer, quite frankly, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that, you kind of imagine all domains of life, romantic relationship, school, career, uh, physical health, mental health, um, unproductive leisure time, productive leisure time. Like you just get all the domains. Oh, I love that distinction between it's... unproductive leisure time and productive <laughs> leisure time. That is that, I've yeah. never heard it phrased that way, yeah. but that is so crucial. You need both. You do need both. Yes. I, you know, um, I have a lot of people with anxiety who cannot not be productive. And my intervention is like, go do something meaningless. <laughs> it's like, go do something where there's no, like, what was your leisure time? Well, I went out and ran five miles. That's not, okay, well, that's, what was your unproductive leisure time? I uh, slept. <laughs> you know, you're like, that's not... <laughs> We're struggling to <laughs> just but, hearing um, that stresses me out. Whew. Oh, I know. I know. But you sort of imagine all these domains of life and you ask two questions. Maybe you rate out of 10 how satisfied you are with each. How well do I think I'm doing with each? And then maybe you have a little score next to it. Um, how much is video games helping this domain of life? OK, social. Yeah, some good stuff there. And, you know, um, stress management. Oh, yeah you know, playing games for an hour to just relax and, and get away from some of the stressors to get back to baseline. Oh yeah. Great. And then also go through and be like, all right, now let me see where might video games be interfering. You know, how much do I play? Okay. So, you know, it's been helping socially in this way because I struggle at, you know, I struggle at school cause I'm anxious and I'm socially anxious. So I struggle and now I have a ton of friends on my gaming system. And so that's great. And I also can tell that now I'm not going out more because I'm so comfortable with it. 
and now I'm my, you know, I'm getting not as good at face to face interactions. So maybe I need to dial it back, right? Or um, it's helping me manage my anxiety. But now also I'm recognizing I'm doing it so much to avoid the anxiety that I'm not doing schoolwork or I'm, I'm now kind of dependent on it. And, you know, you can always mm. do a little test. It's like, you know, okay, so if I, can I not play games for a while or can, or more specifically, can I say, what is the amount of gaming that I want to do that I believe would be the most healthy time? And can I stick with it? I think an hour and a half between this time is the best time. And I need to go to bed at this time. So I'm not staying up till two in the morning and exhausted and depressed the next day. And, you know, if, if there's any problems there, it's just like address it. You know, does that make sense? I love that. It, yeah. It's a, it's an amazing mindset shift to be able to write down the different areas mm. of your life and how satisfied you are with them. I think that's right. a really important exercise for me. I am a chronic overthinker and I love planning out all the different ways my right. life is deficient and it could be better. <laughs> sure. I am, I have problems with doing, I have a doing problem. And, and I think as I look back through my life, I've sorted out that, you know, my reward center is a little bit shifted in the wrong direction. Uh, normal things like completing tasks around the house don't really tend to give me as much Right. Uh, reward as maybe right. they should, or maybe they do for the average person. And so for me, the difference between thinking about it and wanting to right. do it is really right. different than, than actually doing it. So do you have any tools or resources in regards to, okay, I've decided video games, um, I, I have one hour. And if I do more than one hour, it's going to mm -hmm. affect my work because it's mm -hmm. going to affect my sleep mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to have fresh laundry or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm but you're still spending five hours or right. 10 hours when you shouldn't be like, what's, what's the resource? What's the like right. elastic band on the wrist to break the pattern? <laughs> you know, so no, that's a super good question. And that's the question I have to answer with multiple clients every week. Um, and their yeah. parents, that's a really <laughs> that's solid the hard question. Part. It's, yeah. We have an area of our brain. It's, it's, it's about right here on both sides. It's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's basically like the mature person in our head who's like, hey, go to sleep, you know, like, let's stop having fun more. It's executive functioning is what we call it. Um, oh, love it. Cool. It's, it's the regulator, right? It's the guy that pushed up. We really, we really need to be like, I always imagine was like that guy. He um, wears glasses. Noted. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Incredibly old stereotype that's going to be probably dead at this point with LASIK. But yeah. Um, so, but, but, you know, that, that area is in charge of it and not some people, that part of their brain is like super strong. It's a strength of theirs and they come off incredibly self-disciplined. You're like, how do you do that? My God. Um, and then other people, it's a bit of a weakness. For instance, um, ADHD, it's hypoactive. It's less active. And in addition to ADHD, they have something called a DRD4 allele set where it's elongated, which means they actually need more stimulus for the same amount of dopamine as a neurotypical person. So whereas a person, neurotypical reading a book, it's five out of 10 dopamine, some with ADHD is getting a two. So they just need mm. more, right? And, and so it's, it's, it's kind of more and more difficult. That being said, you have two ways to do it. You can set up rigorous systems with no um, slippery sliding scale, sort of like when this alarm goes off, I have 60 seconds to turn it off. And if I don't, that's not a success. And usually by doing, reminding yourself ahead of time, no excuse will work. And even writing down ones you typically make. Uh, one more game. Eh, I didn't feel good about that one. Well, let me just, let me just end where I've got a two to one KDA. Let me just, you know, let me just get to a checkpoint, where, like whatever it is, and you keep making a reason. And if you can't do it, which is okay, by the way, it doesn't mean you're a weak person. Um, you have to set up another accountability system. Um, I, when Breath of the Wild came out, I'm a big RPG guy. Dark Souls, Breath of the Wild, Final Fantasy, those are my style, right? Um, and I love to immerse in a story with relationship building and a, and a narrative and, and really feel involved. And um, when that came out, of course, it's mobile, right? So I stayed in bed the first night playing it till like two or three in the morning. And I've got two children, a wife, my wife's an orthopedist. I got to get up at six. It's, my next day was like terrible. And then that night, oh, no. I had to tell my wife, I said, hey, at 11 o'clock, take this thing from me, right? Because I'm going to Ah, you set, out, set up outside structure. 
you have to set outside structures sometimes, some accountability. Um, all these I things have de device controls. If you have a friend who can have your password so that it will turn off and you can't be like, well, let me turn it on, do that. If you have I don't know if I trust other, any friends that much, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see the value. My wife, my wife recognizes my need for stimulus. So like, I'll be like, you need to take this from me. And she's just like, are you seven? And I'm like, just look, I'm a big boy for saying I need help. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, you and, are, and, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Admit so, you need so. help when you need help. That's a classic right. rule. It's a classic rule. So if, if, you know, there's, there's some books that can help with that. Um, typically they're going to be geared toward uh, ADHD to be honest, but Thing, ones that are not like a book like Getting Things Done or Smart But Scattered or Succeeding with Adult ADHD. Um, but, you know, really anyone where it's executive functioning, uh, The Power of Habit is another good book. These are all ones you could read for self-help. And honestly, I'm, I'm pretty interactive. If you have a question for me, you're welcome to throw them. I'm usually going to answer it. and I can lead you in the right direction. For, you know. I love that. On your but, Twitter, um, right? Yeah, that'd be the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What's that? What's that Twitter handle once again? Um, D R R Kelly. R Kelly. Is awesome. The Love that. Ever since I... Space Jam, R Kelly was the bane of my existence. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Fourth grade, it was, "Do you believe you can fly?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah." And then later, yeah, it's a little worse now, unfortunately. But again, family now. friendly here. <laughs> That's right. Um. Yeah. Uh huh. So so okay. So we've talked a lot about yeah. setting healthy boundaries and mm -hmm. a lot of the stigma around playing video games. But man, that's not even a small portion of the story. I feel. I feel like a much bigger portion of the story is how amazing games are yes. to our mental health. The capability right. that they have to make us feel connected to other people, to make oh. us feel empathetic towards other characters on and on. I could go right. on and on, but I would oh. love to hear your opinion on some of the games to our mental health. Yes. No, I, I, I love how you said it. I mean, I think the, the thing to keep in mind is video games are just a tool. And to ask the question, is it good or bad, is kind of boring um, and, and sort of moot ultimately. The better question, like you said, is so how do we use it, right? How can we use it to help us grow, right? That's the thing, right? And I mean, there are so many ways, um, you know, I, I don't have the book here. I was looking for my other copy, um, but we just published a book with Palgrave called Video Games and Wellbeing, where we basically, that's all we cover. It's like, here are all the ways using video games, here are all the ways that they're helpful, citing all evidence that exists. And my chapter was on positive psychology, which is the study of how things work well versus like how are things broken, right? It's the idea of Love that. let's not focus necessarily on like bumping up weaknesses or like what's wrong with you, let's fix it. It's like, what's your strength? What's great about yeah. you and how can we capitalize on that, right? That's what positive psychology is. And that's the, ra the lab I ran when I was in academia. So um, there is a model that I really like. When we take a step back and we say, ultimately what humans would love to have is happiness, a, a conceptual comprehensive form of happiness, not just feeling joy, but happiness, fulfillment, right? Satisfaction. It's, we're, we're sort of like, well, what do people need? And we've identified five main things. We call it PERMA is what we call it. We have positive emotions, engagement, which engagement is like an emotional investment or commitment to a present activity or task or goal. Sure. Um, relationships, a sense of meaning and a sense of achievement. That's what we need to have good well-being. And so, I mean, I, there's so much good research that, that I could literally, if you care for me to talk about a few examples from studies of how video games improve all five of those. Do you want me to? Uh, can you give us the cliff notes? Because cliff I want notes. people you to actually it. read your chapter of the book yes. uh, if they want to learn more <laughs> sure. and get more in detail. But I would love oh. a little cliff notes. Real cliff notes. I'll give you one per. Um, so I'll, I'll give you one per. So with, with positive emotions, um, we know that when we look at people who play zero to six hours of video games a week, six to 10 and 11 plus, the ones who have the most emotional stability and lesser depression are the ones who play moderate amount, six to 10 hours. Mm. They're actually happier and more stable than the ones who play zero to six. It's a buffer. It can be a really good thing. Like anything else, once you're past, you know, 11 plus, we start to see, you know, it go back the other direction again. But that's a really good one. Um, engagement. You know, people spend so much time and money on yoga classes, mindfulness training, 
meditation to get into what we call a state of flow. Guess what? Uh, according to fMRIs, you get into a state of flow, playing a state of flow, a mindfulness state, playing World of Warcraft in about ten minutes. Right? Wow. Uh, games like Beat Saber, or you know, and, and the more immersive the game, the better. You get into a state of flow instantly, where your limbic system with the amygdala and stress, anxiety, and everything goes away. You're not worried about the past. You're not worried about the future. You're just engaged in the present, being mindful. So it's like an easy, easy peasy trick. Uh, I had well, no it's, idea. Oh, it's I wonderful. love that. And and there's a reason that I use video games and therapy every single day. It been it makes therapy much more effective. In fact, my old research when I was in academia was how do we use video games to improve upon existing therapies? And they do, by the way, yeah. by including them. Um, relationships. Actually, one of the reasons why I downloaded Tetris mm -hmm. Effect for the oh, VR I just got is that. because I've heard that playing that after yeah. a traumatic incident can lower your yes. potential to develop uh, PTSD. Yes. It can. That's a, that, I mean, that's amazing. And it has to do, I'm sure, with that immersiveness, that ability to turn off, yes. you know, the replaying the incident in your head or, or anything like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It stops the loop, right? The, the, yeah, it's it's great. Uh, relationships, 40% of, of online gamers will tell something to an online friend that they will not tell anyone else. Uh, it's a place where you can, you're more comfortable with your race or gender, or ethnicity or um, age or whatever, and, and greater chance of acceptance. So we have greater intimacy in some cases on online relationships. A sense of meaning. We know that, um, you know, we, we've discovered that that the more players it takes to accomplish a goal. Um, oh, thank you. All right, appreciate it. All right. Oh, it's, my wife brought this in. She had found the copy. This is the book. There it is. Referencing. <laughs> That's the one. A book, um, Video Games and Well-Being. I love that. Where can they find Sorry. that? Um, is it on Amazon? You, can, you should be able to find it on Amazon. Yes. Yes. Video Games and Well-Being. Press start. Um, That's a must buy for me. <laughs> I was, I was thinking that I can't wait kid, and I was like, uh Oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a mess if I got my kid coming in here. Um, <laughs> so we dodged, dodged a bullet. Um, so I got my clothes signed. So I'm glad it's her. Um, but so that the more people like, like final fantasy 14, I think of we've known in games that uh, self-reported life satisfaction, sense of accomplishment, and a sense of accomplishment that actually generalizes to the real world that where they feel like more accomplished person is the more people it takes to complete a task in a game, like these massive dungeon raids or something, the more meaning is derived out of it. And then accomplishment, one of, one of the things that is both one of the greatest and for some parents, most problematic part of some of these competitive games is kids get a sense of mastery. We all desire a sense of mastery in something, sport, an academic subject, something, something we're like, that's mine, right? That's there's an activity or a skill set that is a part of my identity, right? And when we don't have that, that's really hard. And in video games, we easily gain a sense of mastery when you platinum Marvel Spider Man, when you get that, you know, three to K three to one KDA in Valorant, like these things where you're like, yes. And then you're you're pat on the back by people you're playing with, like, yo, killer game, bro. And you're like, thank you. Oh my God. Yes. And you leave be like, yeah, good for me. Yeah. And it's and it's meaningful. If you allow yeah. it to be, if you're not hearing all around you, that's pointless. What's, you know, everything else. It's like, no, it's not. It's, you know, you should embrace that. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, video games are wonderful. Is the overall I love synopsis, the clip note. All of that. And a lot of that I didn't know. A lot of that was new information. But at the same time. I'm not, I'm nodding the entire right. time because I'm like, yes, I feel, I felt that I know yes, all of those things intuitively, that. but I didn't have the words or the academia to back it up. But it, all yes. of that is so, so true and, right. and relatable. I can see the chat is lit up right now. Like, yep, that's me. Like, I that's do that great. all the time. I have that. My mastery yeah. is final fantasy 14 glams, the true end game. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I, I want to play that game so badly, but there's occasionally games that I'll I'll specifically not play because I know I'm not I'm like gonna like not prioritize my time well. <laughs> that was me I have with my own Skyrim. Limitations. I couldn't play. Skyrim. I never played Skyrim. I me I knew it'd be a mess. I knew I yep. like, and this is this is me. This is not the game. I'm just I struggle sometimes. With, yeah, <laughs> and so these big open worlds, I'm just like, <gasps> take me, like, you know, <laughs> like kind of things. So. Yes. 
Yes, I was like, I have too many responsibilities as an adult to play Skyrim. I'm sorry. Can't do it. Oh, it's right. I, I started playing Genshin. I love anime. Uh, my next book that I'm, uh -oh. I'm publishing uh -oh. is Psychology of Anime. Everybody in so the chat is talking about Genshin the entire Genshin time. Impact. Talk about so Genshin, I, please. I, I, I spent, my friend was getting so frustrated and he, he's actually in the gaming industry. And uh, he was getting so frustrated because it took me about 35 minutes to make my name. I was like, well, I want to be the woman. And I want my last name to be Kanji for darkness. But I want like, I want to, so, and so you're my brother. So you be Kanji too. And let's see, should I be you a thousand flowers? No, 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 no. Oh, that, I'm like doing all this. And it's like, all right, we're ready to go. And he's like, I'm going to bed, <laughs> you know? Oh. Or, or like Dark Souls. I'll spend hours on the bridge of my character's nose. And like, why? Same. Oh, That's me in Dragon Age games. Oh, Dragon Age. I love it. I can spend four hours in character creators. I love it and I hate it at the same time. <laughs> like, yeah. I wish I could be the guy yeah. who's like, I'll just choose the default orc, you know? No way. Yeah. Can't do it. Yeah. If this no, eyebrow no. is slightly incorrect, I'm restarting it and doing it all over again. I just, I'll break the disc in half and I'll order another one. I've actually, I had to do that for my first Dragon Age playthrough. Yeah. I made my character, I spent a ton of time, I got into the game, first cutscene, I'm like, I hate the voice. I can't use this voice. I got to redo it. It doesn't matter. Oh, for sure. 100%. I've done it many times. And it's frustrating. And at the same time, you're like, you know, you have to do it. Yeah. 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 You just mm -hmm. have to. Just, oh, you can't, you can't being a perfectionist. It. Such a curse. I so I, All well, right. I heard, so, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about some specific games that have been made. Mm. I know there are a ton lately that specifically want to discuss mental yeah. health topics uh how yes. Zenua's sacrifice was mm. well known for that oh uh, gosh, Greece yeah. is one that was yep. beautifully animated and made mm -hmm. kind of to explore grief and loss in an yes. incredible way um what are some of your favorites any ones that that really stand out to you I, I did love Hellblade and the mental health consultant uh is Dr Paul Fletcher uh he's a, a colleague of mine actually he's going to be playing through hellblade with me soon on our stream and we're going to chat we played through it once um talking about psychosis as we went because it's he's a psychosis expert and um before covid he was going to join me and we're going to go through it and he'll talk about all the little things they did of why were their little eyes hidden in there and how does paranoia affect hallucinations but um i loved that one because the company reached out and said we want a mental health consultant and that's becoming more and more common of like, no, we, we don't want to just guess it. Let's get a professional to be with us. So we're doing it right. Right. We're not we're not um, glorifying something we shouldn't. We're not constantly using asylums to accidentally stigmatize depression or or, or behavioral health hospital treatment. Um, and I, I'm not blaming like, please, I'm not ragging on those games. I'm just saying. If all of asylum games, for instance, are always horror games and asylums are terrible. Again, I can't tell you the amount of kids who are who who need to go to behavioral health hospital, who have an awful stigmatized idea of what it is, right? Because of that stuff, and, you know. Well, so we like, can't even really use the word asylum anymore to describe it. That's not what they are, because no. it's the same thing with the term addiction. Maybe we're just not ready to have that word back yet. Maybe let's just take that word away for a little bit. It's, I'm I'm a big semantic guy, and if a word is going to cause words are supposed to help uh, convey a yeah. message and have a collaborative goal to reach a truth. And if it's interfering with that, let's use another word. And I think you're right. I think asylum, addiction, it just interferes with the, what, we're, what we need to do. Right. Um, but so I love these things. So, so I did love Hellblade very much. And when I, I haven't played, played it yet, it, but I look forward to doing so when the time is right. I mean, you're, you'll, you'll be crying in it. Like the emotional, uh, uh loading I cry in everything. Like, uh, but I'm sure I will cry in this too. It's very tight. Well, actually, that was, I think, one of the first videos I saw of you was you playing uh, Remake for the first time. And it's hard not to tear up watching you tear up <laughs> when you first hear yourself. And then that's actually, a, a, I, I had had a colleague who sent me an article that you had written that I loved. Um, Thank you. That you and I, of course, talked about briefly. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. this is so cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so, but, but if I were to think of others, Hellblade would be toward the top. Um, I do love games that um, provide a very good visual way to understand something um, like Reese did with um, depression, right? With the idea, mm, 
well, I don't want to spoil stuff, but yeah, I mean, maybe people haven't played. Um, well, that makes it kind of hard to talk about. But yes, I, I did like that one. Um, gosh, let me think if there's one in particular that... Um, you know, some games are less on the nose, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I really like the Dark Souls series, and we're currently getting a proposal for a from psychology of from software book. We're going to talk about Sekiro, Dark Souls, all these all these games, Demon Souls, Bloodborne. <clears throat> but you know, for for those who play Dark Souls, here's my favorite part: the game is about relighting a fire that's going to go out no matter what, anyway. And then when it comes back, it's going to be less powerful. So eventually, there's going to be no fire. And, but when you're playing this game and it's dark themed and it's depressing and it seems hopeless, every single main character, despite the hopelessness, despite the fact that fire is going out, still has the resolve of their unhallowed self and fight for Gwyn to their max or fight, you know, like they still, they don't stop just because they feel hopeless. Even if they know it's hopeless, they're like, but I am going to keep going. And I love resilience that's portrayed in games. And again, it's a little less on the nose, you know, you know, like some of the other games, but I love that. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons why the last of us means so much to people is the mm. main message yeah. of that game is endure and survive, right? Get through right. it and, and persevere and don't give up always. Right. Oh, it's my favorite uh, message. That's why I yeah. like anime so much. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, but one of the reasons that we actually got in touch yeah. is because Final Fantasy does that for a lot of people. Final yeah. Fantasy has amazing messages in it and, and amazing references to mental health topics, uh, which you actually wrote a book, a book about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I got I got some here. I got some of my books. This Bring one. it up. I love the yep. I love the cover of it. Oh, the artist is amazing. Uh, it was the same artist that did our, oh, if I can, uh, our Psychology of Zelda book, but somewhere else. Anyway, great, great um, artistry. And, um, but yeah, I mean, Final Fantasy, when you get these large, you know, franchises, right? Um, you just have such a massive amount of material, um, you know, that, I mean, in this book, I think, Three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fourteen are all discussed in particular. And then some people talk tactics and some people do whatever. And, and we have topics ranging between uh, PTSD. Uh, and, and I believe one that was largely chosen there was cloud. Yeah. And um, in fact, um, I mean, it's 23 years old. Can I mention? Eris? Uh, can I mention something about the live stream at the end or should I, or are you worried about me spoiling? A bit if it's specifically from FF seven, you're good. Cause I already spoiled it earlier today. Beautiful. So I'm, I mean like with, with final fantasy seven, the ending, one of the ending scenes where cloud and Tifa go into the live stream together and they're re putting back together clouds memories and what's right and what's wrong. That is exactly, exactly what trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy is for people. Wow. That is exactly what we do with narratives of people who have been through something awful. Um, so it's, I will, I, I actually have a save file on that scene that I will bring people in with me before we get started on TFCBT and we play that scene. If they haven't played the game, that's fine. But I give them a backstory, a bit of the trauma and the amnesia that was trauma related and all these losses and, and horrible, wow. you know, vicarious traumas and direct traumas. And we play that part and I say, here's what you and I are going to be. I'm going to be Tifa. And we're going to go through this together and we're going to come out the other side. And you're going to be, you're going to find out who you are again. I mean, so, you know, I, I get, I get so excited talking about it, but you know, Final Fantasy just provides us with so much powerful material uh, to be able to help people. Um, and one of our favorite things is, you know, as psychologists, obviously we use it proactively. Uh, we had just also published a book, um, Integrating Geek Culture into Therapeutic Practice, where we teach clinicians who don't know this stuff specifically how to use it. Um, but even if you're just playing the games, as you very well know, you come out of it knowing a little more about yourself, a little bit more about what you want in life. You come out of it feeling a sense of validation for the emotions and experiences you've had in your own life. Totally an agree. Idea, oh, an idea of how to be resilient the next time you encounter something. Yeah. It's, it's therapeutic just by playing the games. And for me, that game is Life is Strange. You know, it's it's yeah. a game about, you know, many teenage girls going through a lot of the issues that teenage girls 
face and it's not a perfect game by any means, but <clears throat> having the distance to play that game and, and use it almost as a lens to re-examine your own experiences uh, growing up as a, as a young teenager, that game means so much to so many people, myself included, for that reason. You know, yeah. I don't think anybody plays that game, finishes it, and then doesn't think about their own teenage experience, you oh. know? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I, I just, I love it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 the, the series is great. And of course, we, we do have three copies that you can give to, to whoever. Um, and, That's and I hope right. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. very generously providing those. We do have three copies of the book, Final Fantasy. What's the official title? The Psychology oh. of Final Fantasy? Um, the Psychology of Final Fantasy Surpassing the Limit Break. Yes. And, the the cool thing about that is to surpass the limit break you have to you have to go through adversity right you have to reach your limit before you know you can surpass it so the idea that growth only comes from adversity and that's kind of the main story of final fantasy is is it the world is hard and and you will face adversity and how do you become stronger for it how do you surpass the limit break right so beautiful beautiful metaphor mm -hmm. So the way that we're going to be giving out these books is interactive. Um, cool. I have a viewer question that I collected beforehand that I really want to ask you about. Please. And uh, I also want to hear from the audience as well. And we'll select the best answer for uh, a book giveaway. So, so get your chat boards ready, chat keyboards. Get your keyboards ready, chat. <laughs> Okay, here's the question. It's from a regular guy. And the question is, many games explore giving the player moral choices within the game's universe. What are potential benefits to exploring mm. bad or evil choices versus <clears throat> paragon or good choices? So that number one, that's an amazing question. I agree. And I love that one. It's really good. And we've explored that question a lot. Actually, not even just video games, but in drama therapy. The idea of how how does acting that was originally where the research came from it's acting like someone else how can that how can that benefit somebody and uh, it's incredibly beneficial there there's an entire own area of research on avatars and creating your own characters and trying somebody on right um i mean the fact is uh, especially in our formative years of 13 to 18 you know we need to figure out who we are there's not there's this there's this myth that you know i've got to find who I am is if there's a preset version of ourself and we have to find it. That's not true. We get to decide who we want to be and then we become it. We learn how to be that person. And so to be able to play games, to practice, right? To like practice how to, you know, let me try being just the guy who just kills people and just see what, you know, rah, and whatever. And, and maybe there's a sense like in fable or something. And, you know, maybe you get a sense of catharsis, but you also sort of, as even as you're doing it, you're like, I know they're digital, but I just feel so bad. And and then you sort of <laughs> reflect on that. You're like, yeah, they're just, you know, I personally can't be bad characters. I feel so bad. I can't I either. I am the good character 100% of the time. <laughs> and I want to ask chat, chat, what do you pick when you're playing a game? Are you totally Ooh. evil, totally good, or somewhere in the middle? And why? And I'll pick a good one to win the psychology of Final Fantasy. Oh, but. man. So, so I would say both in things like Dungeons and Dragons, which I do a lot of Dungeons and Dragons social skills. Yes. Games, and in video games, which I will also give as, to my clients as homework. The idea is choose, as an example, choose in an aspirational trait you would like to have. Well, I really wish I was someone who um, was assertive because I tend to feel like a burden and, and, and I don't share my opinion because I'm worried that I'll upset somebody. And inherently, that sort of means I don't value my own thoughts. And so I'd love to be a character who's assertive and just sort of says, I disagree, right? And then it's like, yeah, so how would that, if you're, whether it be a D&D &D character or a video game character, what would they do, right? Well, they would, they would actually step up. They'd be the first one in the tavern, right? You know, or whatever and, and play it. And what's amazing is when you practice in that way, you actually learn how to become that person. Wow. That's why drama therapy is, was even its thing. And now we have drama therapy times two because we have this interactive medium with yeah. this whole world that's already there for you. You know, so it's it's an incredible way to figure out who you are, what you want, practice some things, get catharsis. It's, it's a really it's good almost question. A, a complicated way of saying fake it till you make it a little bit. That's, 
Okay, I'll tell you, that's what being a human is. You, you, you decide your ideal self, and then you act like that person, and you that's feel great. like a fraud. But <laughs> that is what life is. Otherwise, you're going to become whatever just your brain makes you feel comfortable with, which is not always good advice. Yeah. But if you say like, I want to be this type of person, I want to be a person who's confident and you go to a party and your cortisol levels are skyrocketing and you're anxious and you're doubting yourself, but you're going into the circle group. You're like, what's up guys? And you're like, chest is out or whatever. And it's like, you don't feel like that guy. Yeah. But every time you do that, right. Um, a guy or gal using colloquialism. Um, every time you do that, you will feel more and more comfortable until the point that now that is who you are. So faking it until you make it is what it means to be a human and become your ideal self. It's so true. It's so true. I have, I have found incredible uh, inspiration in just, we're going to pretend, we're going to do our best and see how it goes. And then we're going to adjust from there. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I That's love really this. Question. Uh, such a good question. And we have so many more good questions. Let's just get to this last one really quickly, okay. since sure. it was a topic that we brought up. What yeah. are some good examples of unproductive leisure time? This was from King oh, Samasha. That's a really good one. Um, so some good examples of unproductive leisure time. First off, the point of unproductive leisure time, and there is one, is to just be doing something where you can get into a state of flow and just, just detach. The, the reality is we do need to be able to face the real world and use problem solving coping to get rid of issues. But the world is not entirely controllable and it's not predictable. In fact, the only thing that's predictable is unpredictability. So we need to have a healthy avoidant coping style where we can say, I'm going to take a break from this chaotic, uncontrollable, unpredictable world with global pandemics and all these issues I have no control over and take an hour or two to just do something where my mind is gone. Um, for me, as an example, watching anime is one of my favorites. Um, I just, I get in it and, and it's just, and I'm just lost in the world and it's amazing. And it helps me connect to my emotional self. And I, and then I learn how to well, I then wind up taking it productive because I take notes as I watch it. So I probably should work on that. But <laughs> I know. So I'm not, At least I'm you not, acknowledge it. I'm not practicing what I preach on that one. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's those things. So for a lot of people, um, you know, playing video games can be it. Like playing video games by yourself could be unproductive. Maybe playing video games with buddies. But I don't know. I could make the argument that it, proactively socializing is productive. Um, let's see some other productive one, other unproductive ones. Um, taking a nap for an hour. It's a nice self-care activity. Um, it's, it's, a <laughs> I love naps. I am an excellent napper. I'm getting a little carried away with naps these days. Um, but you, me, me too. You have kids. Um, I feel like you're allowed. <laughs> you, you'd think so. You'd like to think so, but <laughs> they, they would, they would, they would say otherwise. I think. <laughs> They at least say otherwise when you're trying to do it. Um, I damn. believe that. Right. Um, <laughs> I was, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so those were as productive leisure time would be like, you know, playing an instrument, um, exercising, uh, work, uh, playing a game that you're, you're, you've got like a goal in mind and maybe there's a little bit of stress that comes with it, like Minecraft, where you're trying to grind to get something. Um, For me, it's but, gardening. I love oh, gardening, but it is a lot of work sometimes. So that's productive yeah. leisure time for me. Right. And they do kind of hover, right? I mean, yeah. they really do. I'd say the main thing to focus on, guys, is you need to have a few minutes a day at least, right? To do something where you're not worried about an outcome. You're not, you know, there's no stress to it. You're just detached and you're just getting to a state of flow and you're just relaxing and just letting all that stress come back down to baseline for a bit. And just, it's really a gift to yourself. It's just to be like, you know what? I deserve a moment to just be calm and relax and be present. And whatever you can find to do that, great. You know, um, but it's very important to have that, especially now with everything. Yeah. And bonus points, if you can get six deep breaths in seven, because we do seven here. If you can get oh, seven cool. deep breaths in during that bonus points, it'll help so much. Oh my gosh. Deep breathing is massive. Yep. Okay. This conversation, oh man, all of our panels today have been amazing and I want them to keep going on forever. But unfortunately we have limited time and we yep. have other amazing content for SRGCon sure. to be getting to. So um, let's 
finish off with some closing mm -hmm. thoughts. And uh, if you have any, you don't have to, if you don't want okay. to, and uh, remind people where they can find you again. Sure. Um, I mean, the only closing thought I would give, and this is coming off the cuff, is, you know, to the best of your ability, through your thoughts and your actions, glorify and embrace resilience. Um, life is very, very hard. And it, it, it can very easily get you down. And if it has got you down, you're not weak for it. And there's nothing wrong with you. But I know you have the strength to. And the idea is your brain represents millions of years of adaptability. All of our brains represent. It's not if you're a 15 year old, it's not like you've survived 15 years. Your DNA, your coding, the thing that makes you be has survived intense heat, cold, starvation, abyss, bacterial viruses, predators, um, all these things. It has survived it. You are built program to be the apex of a adaptable creature. Don't let the world make you forget that and think that you're weak or frail or anything. You, you can be resilient, glorify it, embrace it, and take care of yourself in the process. Um, find, the, find the resources needed to do so. And if you are a part of this amazing community, you're a gamer. And that's a part of that. That's a part of what makes you adaptable. So, you know, try to maybe sit down and say, how, how do I want to more proactively use video games in my geek culture? Things that I'm really, really passionate and unapologetically enthusiastic about to make me stronger and more resilient and, and, and ultimately happier. So that'd be my message. Um, That's amazing, and by the way. <laughs> I got a little emotional. It was a oh. really, really important message. And the chat is lit up right now, oh, loving it as well. Oh, good, good. Um, as far as finding me, um, so you can, of course, um, uh, D-R-R-K-E-L-L-Y on Twitter, and I'll, I'll be as active as I can be. Um, and I really will. It's not, you don't have to be famous or have thousands of followers. Talk, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. And I'd love to, I'd love to get to know you. Um, we do the same in our uh, Geeks Like Us community. We, we try our best um, there. Um, you can, um, if you ever want to catch some content, you can always check our are professionally geeky folk and their channels on our Twitch. It's um, Geeks Like Us, but with threes instead of E's at the front. And um, yeah, and if you have any questions for me, please on Twitter, I, I, I don't want you to view me as um, distant or propriety with like who I talk to. If, if you have something pa you're passionate about and you have a question or something genuine, I, I, want, to, I want to answer it if I can. This, I hope that makes sense. I love that. Yeah, this is a very interactive community. So you're about to get 100 tweets right now. I have no problem with that. No more naps for you today. <laughs> right. I got work after this too. So. Oh, no. All right. Well, I'll leave you to it then. Thank you so much for joining you, us, Bruce. chat. Thanks for hanging out. And that brings us to the end of this panel. What did you think? Do you have thoughts? Do you have feelings? I know I left this panel feeling so full of ideas, of inspiration. I felt like all of the hours that I have put into playing video games, <laughs> Final Fantasy XIV, <14, laughs> um, are actually beneficial for me. They're an example of unproductive leisure time, which I had never before heard the distinction between productive leisure time and unproductive leisure time. And honestly, I just, there were so many good concepts introduced in this panel. Um, I would love to talk about them with you in the comments. Please let me know your thoughts. And of course, you can always find Dr. Ryan Kelly on Twitter and um, let him know what you thought about the panel as well. I would, I would love um, for him to hear from us because he was a wonderful guest and I appreciated his time so much. That's going to be all for today's video, but please remember if you would like to see another amazing panel at SRGCon this year in 2022, April 22nd, there's a lot of twos going on. This is the second SRGCon in 2022 on April 22nd. It's kind of it's kind of a lot and I just realized it right now. But anyways, all the information on how to join us for some amazing new panels and special events and cosplay contests and all of that good stuff, it's in the description. You can check it out at patreon.com slash thestrangerebel or you can go to www.srgcon.com and we would love to see you there. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it, share it with all your friends so they can enjoy it too, and of course, please subscribe to Strange Rebel Gaming so you don't miss the next video. That's all. I love you all. Bye!